Our New Testament text picks up in a familiar spot. The angel Gabriel has announced to Mary that she is carrying the Son of the Most High. She is baffled and hears as comfort, for nothing is impossible with God. We begin today immediately following that moment, Luke 1, verses 39 through 56. Listen for the word of the Lord. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leapt in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me? That the mother of my Lord comes to me. For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leapt for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. And Mary remained with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned to her home. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my lips and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Every Christmas Eve, the Stuckey family, my mother, father, the cat, and I gathered in our small sunroom before church. Dressed in his Sunday best, my dad would stroll over to the record player, drop the needle on Nat King Cole's The Magic of Christmas, and for an hour or so, we would listen to the beautiful, crooning melodies of Nat with his band. That is how I remember it, at least. I'm sure my mother has some color to add, more screaming, probably, a hidden bow or ten, a mad dash to get to the car, to get to church, only reasonably late. And more likely than not, that old record player was a worn-out cassette. But the Rockwellian image is burned into my mind, backed always, always by Nat King Cole. That one detail I am sure of, his voice still melts me today when one of his Christmas songs comes on the radio. It sends me back to that sunroom in 1992, and I truly believe in my heart of hearts, I truly believe that all other Christmas records are, in comparison, terrible. <laughs> Frankly, if I'm being honest, I think we should have just stopped writing Christmas music in about 1962 with exceptions, of course, for Mariah Carey. <laughs> and the reason I believe that is a little ditty penned in the tumultuous early 90s, and I know this will be someone's favorite, so forgive me and hang with me, called Mary, Did You Know? Mary, did you know, the singer asks, that your baby boy will one day walk on water? Mary, did you know that your baby boy will save our sons and daughters? Did you know that your baby boy has walked where angels trod? And when you kiss your little baby, you have kissed the face of God. 
it's fine, really. It serves a purpose, the song does. It pulls at our heartstrings, and it hearkens us to Jesus' cross, to his adulthood, to its credit. It's also a Christmas song about Christ. Here is my problem with it. It seems pretty clear, pretty certain, really, that yes, Mary knew. Not only that, Mary wrote a better song. <laughs> In Nazareth, Mary heard the news from Gabriel. You will conceive, the Son of the Most High will reign, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary was so overcome, so perplexed, so joyful that she packed up and set off for her cousin Elizabeth's home some 70 miles into the countryside. It is a strange scene. And frankly, it shouldn't have happened. A young maiden at that time engaged to be married would be expected to stay put until her wedding, living in seclusion until she took her groom. We have no indication that she even told Joseph where she was going, that she even told Joseph that she was going. Met with this life-altering news, Mary just got up and went. Even here, by showing us Mary's journey to her cousin, Luke is preparing us. The arrival of the Messiah means strange things, unexpected things, impossible things. A poor young woman carrying eternity sets off for a faraway countryside. That same woman, favored for her loneliness, is greeted by her elder, a woman who herself is carrying the prophet in her womb. Set the scene in your mind. Here is Elizabeth, whose son the Baptist will prepare the way, and here is Mary, whose son the Christ will bring salvation. Before Mary can even get to her door, Elizabeth recognizes in her the glow of eternity and utters a world-changing proclamation that confirms Gabriel's visitation earlier, calling Mary the mother of my Lord. Elizabeth is the very first person in the gospel to confess faith that Jesus is Lord before Jesus is even born. Like I said, strange things start happening when the Messiah is on the horizon. It is an incredible moment. And not only because Luke foregrounds the speech of two women in a culture where women were expected to be silent. It's incredible because these two women are living, embodying, literally, theology. In their lives and their songs, they teach us who God is and show us exactly what God will do. Elizabeth called Mary the mother of my Lord, and Mary was so full, so overcome, so joyful that the only thing she could do to make meaning of the incredible was to sing about it. Mary, did you know that your baby boy is Lord of all creation? Did you know that your baby boy will one day rule the nations? Gabriel told her. Elizabeth told her again, and then she told us. Mary knew. I don't mean to harp on it, except for I kind of do. What really gets me about Mary Did You Know is that it's catchy. It's one of those songs that just sort of gets stuck in your head, earworms they're called, and there's really no way of banishing it from your inner musical monologue. You just have to ride it out and just keep singing it in your head. I find myself singing Mary Did You Know almost reflexively during this Christmas season, and then I find myself wondering what exactly Mary knew and when, like some biblical law and order, songs have a way of becoming our own. That's why we sing hymns each Sunday. They teach us through poetry and repetition who God is. They are often our first exposure to theology. We believe that there are three kings because the hymn told us so. We are sure that God is a mighty fortress not because of the Psalms but because Luther first told us. That's the power of music. Who doesn't swoon remembering their first love when Sam Cooke croons what a wonderful world who doesn't rage at jolene with her auburn hair or weep as whitney mourns lost love who's not transported to a little sunroom and a charmed childhood when hearing those first notes of chestnuts roasting on an open fire songs do something to us they help us understand and organize our lives 
their repetitions stick in our minds and make meaning of our discord. Listening to Mary Did You Know, wondering just how much of a handle she had on her, her role in salvation history is an easy task, a nice melodic musing. It is much more difficult to actually listen to Mary because Mary's song beautiful though it is, is rather inconvenient. And it can make merry discord of our nicely ordered lives. Consider the irony. Today in our beautiful sanctuary, wearing our bespoke Christmas clothing on our well old walnut pews, we hear God praised for scattering the proud bringing down the powerful and sending the rich away without their dinner. That's us. We cannot hear that. We cannot truly listen to Mary without being implicated. We live and prosper in a world that rewards power an economy that exploits laborers, a society that refuses to recognize its most vulnerable. I don't mean to sound harsh. That's the text we are given. That is the scriptures that we call holy. The Magnificat is a rebuke of the status quo, both then and now. It is a challenge to ambivalent discipleship. It is a hard pill to swallow, but it's also an opportunity. In the Magnificat, Mary directs praise from herself to God. Not to get too in the weeds, but she sings in the past aorist tense, a grammatical form that calls into the present things that have happened before. Mary understands that the same God who called Israel into being now calls her to Bethlehem. The same God who proclaimed comfort to the exiles in Babylon, good news for the brokenhearted and release for the prisoners now works in lowly Nazareth. Hers is a hymn of praise to the God who remembers, who from creation to the present shows mercy to lowly forgotten people. Mary recognizes God's work in the world because she has experienced it in her own life. She knows that the God who remained faithful to poor Israel, who recognized among the grandeur of kings the humility of a lowly maiden, rests now in her womb. That is why Mary sings, what God did for Israel, God did for Mary. And what God did for Mary, God does for us. Recognition. Reconciliation, redemption. But there's a catch. We've got to keep reading this text, verses 50 through 56. With all of their talk of power and money, lay it bare. As long as we are sitting pretty on our self-made thrones, as long as we concern ourselves only with how we look, or what the markets are doing, or when we can acquire the next best thing, we will not be able to joyfully celebrate, as Mary did, the coming of the Messiah. As long as we continue to believe the myth that we are self-made and self-sufficient, that the cars we drive and the lives we live are a divine tick for tack, we will be blinded to God's work in our world and in our lives. We will be unable to experience the advent of Christ's kingdoms and the reversal that it brings as unmitigated joy. It is only when we celebrate the leveling plane of God's mercy, offering concern for our neighbor, challenging economies of scarcity, and making roads for those struggling down the paths of life, that we will truly rejoice in God's work. 
Mary sings her song, but it is not a soothing lullaby, at least not most of the time for us. If we are to experience God's expansive mercy and bountiful blessing, then we have got to allow ourselves to be cut down to size. We have got to make the Magnificat ours, which requires a decentering, away from our wants and needs, from what we can accumulate and accrue, and toward the humble, vulnerable God lying exposed in a stable. Mary didn't have a crystal ball. She couldn't have known exactly what would happen at every moment of Jesus' life. But she knew what God's coming into the world meant. She knew what a rightly ordered kingdom looked like. And she knew that things were about to turn. Mary knew. The rich, the self-satisfied, the rulers who have taken what is rightfully God's, they have enough. God passed them by. Instead, choosing to fill the hungry, the poor, a lowly maiden, God is at work in our world, transforming our culture of scarcity and exclusion into a table of bounty where all are invited, especially those most forgotten, and all are, for, are fed. And God is working in us too. God is turning us and reorienting us in order that we too, when greeted and challenged by the living Lord, might sing with Mary, experiencing as our own the joy of a world about to turn. Mary knew it, and now we do too. The question this Advent is what we're going to do about it. Now, when you're recapping this sermon for all of your friends and family, as I know you do after each sermon you hear, when you're rereading it later, taking notes, when you're making the 1115 crowd jealous that they chose to listen to adorable children sing the gospel rather than listening to Mary's cutting Magnificat, do me a favor and don't focus too much on Mary, did you know? Let's say for the purpose of retelling that I am ambivalent about the Christmas classic. Focus instead on what Mary's joy might mean for us. We don't talk about it a lot because it sounds a little bit crazy, but we are waiting for Christ too. We, like Mary, have an opportunity to play a part in bearing Christ into the world. We can continue the work begun at creation the work perfected during the incarnation, the work of welcome and risk and equality, the work of joy. At Christmas, we proclaim the impossible, the infinite, made finite in flesh. God become human, the Messiah born to his people. Nothing is impossible for the God who has done that. If a child can be born a savior, then the world can be transformed. There is hope. The hungry can be filled. The poor can be housed. The rich, we can finally recognize when enough is enough. That is who our God is. That is what our God teaches us. That is what our God does. Elizabeth knew, Mary knew, we know this Advent, we have to ask ourselves if we will be participants in the great reversal or if we will attempt, because of our own comfort, our own needs, our own wants, to thwart the Messiah. But here's the other thing, and Mary knew it too. Whether we welcome it or not, whether we choose to see it or ignore it, the Messiah is coming. God is faithful even when we dig in our heels. And the world is 
about to turn. Repeat it. Sing it until it becomes your own. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of the, their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lonely. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and his descendants forever. Amen.